Welcome to First United Methodist Church in Starkville, Mississippi. We're proud that you're joining us in worship today. People have gathered uh, throughout the community in the church building itself, and now we invite you to come and be a part of us in, in your living room or wherever you may be as we worship together today. Welcome to the morning service of First United Methodist Church of Starkville, the church in the heart of the town with Christ in the heart of the church. Our weekly Sunday services are at 8.30 and 11 a.m. and our evening service is at 6 p.m. Join us now as we come together and exalt Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's wonderful to look out and see all of you out there. And I hope if we have any visitors out there, you receive a warm welcome today. There are friendship registers located on the pews around you, so please take those out and fill them out and pass them down. And if you don't know who you're sitting next to, take a moment and introduce yourselves and get to know each other a little better. We have several important announcements today. Uh, one is tonight we do have evening worship at 6 o'clock followed by a coffee house that the youth are doing. Cindy's heading this up and it's bound to be good even though I understand we were scrounging for talent in the church. So please come out tonight. I'm sure it will be a fun time. Also, we have two Habitat work days coming up this week on the 23rd and 24th. So if you have some time this weekend, come on out and help us build our house. And today we're delighted that um, Joni Seitz is here with Senior Services to talk about our offering that we're taking up today. And so we'd like to invite her up here now. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to share information uh, with you about Mississippi Methodist Senior Services Sunday Fund and how your gifts will, to this fund will make a significant difference in the lives of elders in this area and throughout the state. Uh, Mississippi Methodist Senior Services has been serving older adults uh, regardless of their denomination throughout the state for almost 40 years providing housing and care like that that's offered at Trinity Place Retirement Community here in the Golden Triangle. At times, caring for elders also means providing financial assistance when a resident who has outlived his or her resources must ask for help. And that help comes from Mississippi Methodist Senior Services Sunday Fund. For some elders, the Sunday Fund provides for an unexpected one-time need, and these situations are created uh, that would, these are situations that would create an, uh, an unusual hardship, hardship for a resident if he or she had no assistance. Additionally, and in most cases, the fund provides monthly assistance to residents who need a supplement in order to meet their basic cost of living or cost of, of care needs. And typically, this monthly assistance ranges from $500 to $1,000 a month. Now let's stop for a moment and let me share with you a hypothetical situation. Let's begin this hypothetical example with an 80-year-old woman who is widowed. Let's continue by saying she has moved into one of senior services facilities, uh, and that was about five years ago. She had money saved and was drawing $1,000 a month in Social Security and retirement benefits. Further, in the past five years, she has had to go to the hospital two or three times, which is certainly not unusual. She has developed diabetes, her eyesight is failing, and now she is taking eight or 10 prescription drugs, which cost her several hundred dollars a month. As a result, she finds herself without any excess funds and her social security and retirement checks no longer cover her rent, her drug bills, and her other necessary monthly expenses. What is this precious woman going to do? She turns to us for assistance from the Sunday Fund. Today, I'm here to ask you to prayerfully 
consider what your financial commitment will be to this critical ministry. In order for you to do this, let me share the answers to four questions we hear frequently about the Sunday Fund. Number one, who can receive Sunday Fund assistance? Any resident who lives on uh, any of senior services in any of senior services facilities is eligible for Sunday Fund, and all residents are aware of the Sunday Fund. In order to receive assistance, a resident's total assets must be less than $5,000 from all resources. If a person would like to be considered, they speak confidentially with our executive director, they together fill out an application, and the application goes before the board of um, the corporation to be approved. And all assistance is confidential. Let me repeat that. All assistance is confidential. It's very important that we assist our elders as they need to be assisted, but it's also very important that we honor and respect them with the confidentiality of this information. Number two, how can you help? Every person counts and every gift counts. You can help our elders in several ways. First, get involved with an elder you already know if you aren't already involved in their lives. This will enrich them and it will certainly enrich you. And secondly, your gift to the Sunday Fund will help minister to the needs of at least one of our elders who is blessed by our work. Three, how much money does the Sunday Fund need? The 2008 Sunday Fund goal is $280,000. It is important to remember that all of the money to be raised for this fund has to be raised through private donations such as yours. Senior Services is connected to the, to the Methodist Conference, but we do not receive any apportionment monies. So all Sunday Fund monies are only from personal gifts such as yours. <coughs> also, it's important to note that all of your donations, 100% of your donations goes directly to assisting our er elders in the Sunday Fund. Four, how does the Sunday Fund affect us locally in the Golden Triangle? Trinity Place Retirement Community has several residents who are currently receiving fu Sunday Fund assistance. The annual total of that assistance is $61,000, which brings the statewide ministry very close to home. In closing, let me say that I believe the Sunday Fund is a real demonstration of our gra gracious and loving Father's promise to watch over his children when they experience dark clouds and weariness because of financial difficulties. This crucial ministry allows us to prayerfully respond to God's call to help those who are in need and allows God's precious elders to feel his faithfulness. Thank you. Thank you, Joni. As in any church family, this week has been filled with joys and sorrows, and so this week we need to remember um, some people. We celebrate with Wendell and Sue in the wedding of their daughter, Wendy Gibson, yesterday, and they put the flowers out in the foyer for them um, that didn't make it in the bulletin. We also celebrate with Gaddis and Pam Hunt on the birth of their grandbaby, and Richard and Laurie Wright on the birth of their son. His name is Brody Parker, so please remember them this week. And we also have some sympathies um, this week to David Laughlin in the death, death of his mother, Sarah, and also to Martha Ruth Parvin in the death of her sister, Faye Spivey. So please remember these families as you pray this week. Would you please stand and join with me in the call to worship? Holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you claim us as your beloved ones. How majestic is your name. Creator God, in whose image we are made, help us reflect your love. How majestic is your name in all the earth. Redeemer God, reconciling all creation to yourself, draw us closer to you. How majestic is your name in all the earth. Sanctifying God, sustaining us with your love, guide us in your ways of mercy and peace. How majestic is your name. How majestic is your name, O God, and we are so grateful for your presence in our worship and in our lives. So come, Lord Jesus, and speak to our hearts today. Come, Holy Spirit, renew and revive us with your life-giving breath, so that we might live again as your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Our opening hymn of praise is number 77, How Great Thou Art.
standing and turn to page 881 and let us recite together this historic confession of our faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. unite our hearts in prayer. <clears throat> oh God, you are our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. You created the earth and everything in it and called it good. You redeemed us through Jesus Christ and you sustain us no matter what we're going through with the power and comfort of the Holy Spirit. You created us in your image and we need you in our lives. Help us to remember that as our lives get filled with the many priorities of family and work to keep you at the center. Remind us to start each day and to end each day with you so that we order our lives the way you would have us order them. So often the world tells us to order our lives differently, and when we do that, we find our lives very full, but our souls very empty. We long for something this world cannot give us, you, your presence in our lives, your strength and courage and compassion, your forgiveness and your mercy. Forgive us when we let the world order our lives and pour out your mercy on us so that we might center our lives on you. Help us see the ways we might share the love of God, the grace of Christ, and the peace of the Holy Spirit in our daily lives so that we might not only be your disciples, but might make more disciples. Today we also lift Danny and Marilyn to you and ask that you wrap them in your traveling mercies as they travel to your holy land for both study and Sabbath and then bring them safely back home to us, renewed and refreshed from your inspiring place. And it's together as your beloved family that we offer you the prayer that Jesus taught us so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now if our children will come meet Miss Jane at the altar. Got a small crowd this morning, don't we? I believe everybody's already started their vacation and they didn't tell us, did they? You've already gone. It's great to see you all today. Do you all ever play a game called Follow the Leader? Do people still play that? When I was a little girl, we played it. You have a leader and everybody lines up behind the leader and the leader says, follow me, and you go behind the leader and you do everything he does. Or, and if the leader um, turns right, you turn right. If the leader puts arms out and does the airplane, do the airplane. Anything the leader does, you do, right? That's follow the leader. Did you know that when Jesus called his disciples, he said, follow me? But it wasn't a game. It was real life. And the first person he called, first disciple he called was Andrew. And Andrew thought Jesus was so great, he called his brother Simon Peter and brought him. And pretty soon James and John joined him and then eight other men. So Jesus had 12 disciples who followed him. They went everywhere he went. They listened to him. 
They, they learned from him, and they also told other people about Jesus and what he did and just the good news of God's Son. Now, those disciples are gone. Those 12 disciples are all gone. But did you know that there are still disciples today, that Jesus still has disciples? And did you know that you could be a disciple and I can still be a disciple of Jesus? What we have to do is follow the leader. When Jesus says, follow me, we say, yes, Lord. You know that song we sing, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord? We say yes, Lord, when Jesus asks him to follow us. And we say yes by doing what we can do to learn about him. And you're in church today, and that's great. We, we read the Bible, we pray, we tell other people about Jesus, and we live the way that he wants us to live. That's how we say, yes, Lord, we will follow you. And Jesus is still calling people today to be his disciples. And I want to follow him and be his disciple. And I hope that you all will do that too. Will you pray with me? Yes, Lord, we will follow you. We want to be your disciples. Show us the way. Help us follow you always. Thank you that you love us. Amen. We don't have children's church. The today. offertory hymn is number 145, Morning Has Broken. Would you stand, please? <laughs> the earth with your abundance. Bless our gifts and offerings so that more people might know of the abundance of your love for all people. We ask this in the name of the one who gave his all. Amen.
Our scripture today comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Thank you, choir. A beautiful song, a peppy song. I like that. That's got the adrenaline flowing so no one can go to sleep for the next 45 minutes. <laughs> At least 45 minutes. <laughs> Are you familiar with the name Wendy Bagwell? That's really an odd name for a man, Wendy, W-E-N-D-Y. But Wendy Bagwell is a gospel singer, a storyteller, and sometimes comedian. In uh, early days, he and his family traveled, in particular, all over the South, singing gospel music, and in particular, to uh, uh, in local churches. My my favorite Wendy Bagwell story is the one that he tells on himself about the time that they were invited to sing in a little bitty church in Kentucky. And when they arrived, they plugged in all their instruments and they began to sing. And it wasn't long before all the people in that little congregation were standing and shouting. And Wendy felt good about that. He thought the music must be touching the folks in this crowd and he felt good. But then to his surprise, 
they brought out five of the biggest rattlesnakes that he had ever seen. And they began passing them around. They offered him one. And as he put it, I said, give mine to Geraldine. <laughs> well, from that point on, things got worse instead of better. So Wendy thought it was time for them to leave. However, people were standing in the aisle of the church, the only aisle in the church, with snakes in their hands, so there was no way for them to get back to the door that they had entered. So Wendy turned to Geraldine and said, where is another door? And she said, I've already looked and there ain't one. And Wendy asked, well, reckon where they want one. That's a pretty good question for any church, don't you think? Where do we need other doors? Where do we need other doors? Doors that will allow others to enter in without restriction. Doors that would allow anyone to enter. Yet, at the same time, doors that will allow us to exit, to go beyond the walls of, of this beautiful church and do ministry in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Reckon where we need other doors. Almost everyone is familiar with the scriptures that, that Stacy's read today. The, the church calls these verses of scripture simply the Great Commission. The Great Commission. But someone has said that the biggest fault of the Christian church today is the great omission of the great commission. And that just might be true. That just might be true. But there's more to it than that. These verses are found at the, the end of the book of Matthew. And some Bible scholars would argue that, that Matthew is the only writer of the four Gospels that, that has a clear ending. The only one of the Gospels that, that seems to have a, a clear, definite ending. For some, it, it's hard to tell where Mark ends because it looks like there might be two endings and, and maybe someone has meddled with it a little bit. And, and Luke, well, Luke ends his Gospel only to continue on with the writing of the book of Acts to tell about the, the beginning of the early church, the Acts of the Apostles, and tell about how God worked in their life. And John, well, John, he ended his gospel by saying, there are a lot of other things that happened, but I just didn't have room to write them all down. It's only Matthew then who ends his gospel with saying, Jesus has lived Jesus has died. Jesus has arose again. Now there is work for the Christian church to do, period. Period. There is work for the church to do. You see, this is the end of Jesus' ministry here on earth. And, and now it's the beginning of the ministry of those who would follow Jesus. There is work to do. There is work to do. Jesus had been teaching these disciples for about three years. He had, he had taught them about God. He had talk, taught them about the kingdom of God. His disciples, you see, were, well, they were like so many of us. The disciples were ordinary and common people. Ordinary and common people. And, and Jesus was teaching them about bringing common, ordinary folks into the kingdom of God. Now, it had come down to this last week of Jesus' life on earth, his ministry here on earth. He and his disciples had gone through what you and I call Palm Sunday, and then the Last Supper, and then Good Friday, and then that miracle on Easter Sunday morning, the resurrection. And now it's down to Jesus' last words to those disciples before he ascends into heaven. So... What did he say? What did Jesus say, those last words to those disciples? What was most important 
to him. What did he say to them? Well, he said, go and make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to, to obey all the things that I have taught you. And remember, I am with you always. Always. That's what he said. That's what he said. And so since that time, since, since that time, the church has called this the Great Commission. The church has called these words of Jesus, go and make disciples, the Great Commission, meaning that that is what each Christian is commissioned to do. In fact, that is our mandate, my friends, as Christians. That is our mandate. This is what we must do. Our program staff met this week for a day of retreat and reflection out at Burnt Oak. This is a beautiful retreat center, and I recommend it to you highly. And coming from that retreat, coming from that day of reflection, is the new mission statement for our church. It says, the mission of First United Methodist Church is to welcome, worship, witness, and grow as disciples. You'll be seeing that like it's printed right under my sermon title in the bulletin, www.growasdisciples.com. In fact, I encourage you to punch that into your computer when you get home today and see what you get. See what you get. Our mission, our goal, our commission, our mandate, my friends, is to make disciples. That's what Jesus was saying to his disciples. And I'm convinced that that is what Jesus is saying to each of us who strive to be disciples of Christ. He said, go, go. We must note that, that Jesus said this to his disciples. He said it to his disciples. He didn't say it to a bunch of folks that were hanging around the market in Jerusalem. He didn't say that to folks he didn't know that he hasn't worked with. He said that to those whom he had taught and to those with whom he had worked for three years now. So one very important lesson for us today something important for us to learn is that you cannot go and make disciples until you are a disciple. You cannot go and make disciples until you are a disciple. Because, well, we need to learn that. Sometimes we try it, don't we? Sometimes we try to, as a church, go forth and make disciples when, when we're not really sure we're disciples ourselves. In fact, to do that, to go and make disciples without being disciples, is just about as hard as doing what that old farmer once said about trying to grow a crop without any rain. He said, that's as hard as trying to come back from somewhere you ain't never been. Try that sometimes. Try that sometime. Before we can go and make disciples, first we must be a disciple. We must be a disciple. Be one who patterns his or her life after Christ. Be one who lives as Christ would have us to live. To be a disciple is certainly not to be perfect. It's certainly not to be perfect, even though that should be our goal. Perfection should be our goal. As good Methodists, we should always strive for perfection. But those first disciples were certainly not perfect, kind of like us. You, you do remember that, that those first disciples that Jesus handpicked, they, they weren't perfect. Don't you remember Peter getting scared and sinking into the water on the Sea of Galilee when he tried to try his hand at walking on the water to Jesus. You, you remember that? And, and what about James and John, the, the, the brothers that Jesus himself called sons of thunder because they were so boisterous? And, and you probably remember how several of the disciples were fussing over who should be first 
one day, and that really disappointed Jesus. No, they weren't perfect. They weren't perfect, and neither are we, but we're still to make disciples. We are still to make disciples. Making disciples and being a disciple, they have to go hand in hand. You can't be one without the other. You can't make disciples until you are one. And if you are one, you will be willing to make one. I didn't go too fast for you, did I? You cannot make disciples until you are one. And if you are one, you will be willing to make one. Daily, we must live as if Jesus is with us and like Jesus is in us. And that alone will change the world. It really will. Living as though Jesus is with us and in us will change the world. Just try it and see if I'm wrong. Living that way will change our world. I read about a, a Russian monastery that was once dying. In, in fact, the monastery was declining very quickly, and, and all the brothers who were living there were growing old and feeble, and, and many had already died. And, and the villagers, they had stopped going by the monastery because it was boring and, and, and dying. There, there was just so little life there. And young men, young men were no longer interested in, in dedicating themselves to the monastic order and living there at the monastery. There was just nothing inviting about that place. And as you might imagine, this decline led to a whole lot of worry and the loss of hope led to a lot of bitterness. So in desperation, one day the, the abbot went to visit a, a wise old hermit that he had heard about to ask his advice. And he explained the problem in, in great detail. Well, the hermit prayed for the abbot, but said nothing more, nothing more at all. And, and so the two men sat in silence for a long, long time until finally the abbot couldn't take it any longer. And he begged the hermit to, to please give him some advice, to give him an answer. And the hermit replied, I am sorry. But there really isn't anything that I can tell you. Nothing at all. I, I don't know what the future holds for your monastery. I am sorry. And then he added, oh, but there is this. I believe the Messiah is in your midst. The Messiah, thought the, the old abbot. Who is it? Who among us? is the Messiah. And he rushed back to the monastery to, to report his unexpected news. So the brothers gathered around and they began to question, who is it? Who is it? Who among us is the Messiah? Surely not Brother Nicholas. He gripes too much. And, and surely not Brother Alex. He's too whiny. But what if? What if? And on it went. And each time the brothers began to suspicion that one of them might be the Messiah. They, they began to treat each other with, with respect and, and kindness and love. And, and that same spirit began to extend into the village because now the rumor was that, that the Messiah was somewhere around. And, and so they began to wonder if maybe the Messiah might be their neighbor. Well, though no one was ever identified as the Messiah, the monastery began to grow and thrive and the village was blessed and young men devoted themselves to the faith because Jesus was with them my friends Jesus is always with us then discipleship is ongoing it's every day every day of our lives it's, it's not something for a special day it's not something for just Sundays or some special season. No, it's the very pulse of every moment that you and I live and, and breathe. It's the pulse of every moment lived in the kingdom of God. That's the easiest way to make disciples. In fact, that's probably the best way to make disciples, living our lives knowing that Jesus Christ is in us and Jesus Christ is with us. 
The Great Commission tells us that, that the making of disciples also includes baptism. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus said. And, and we know that baptism is the beginning. It's the starting point of our discipleship. One of the, the instructions that Jesus left for us is to teach. To teach. And that's what we have to do as a church. To teach our little ones. To teach them about Jesus. The love of Jesus. Isn't that what we promise each time we baptize someone here? Well... The Greek word that, that uh, is used, uh, is translated uh, as teach, also means to disciple, but there's more to it than that. It also means to be discipled, to be discipled, to be taught ourselves, to learn ourselves, to put ourselves in a position to learn and grow about and, and learn about Christ and grow in, in our faith. And, and that knowledge, that knowledge should cause our Sunday schools and our UMW and our youth and our spiritual formation classes and, and the whole church, all the groups in the church to grow in a mighty way as each of us, as each one of us strive to learn about Jesus and learn about being a disciple, learn more about how Christ would have us to go and make disciples. My friends, before we can go, we must grow. We must grow. We must be intentional about an inward journey, about what happens on the inside of us, an inward journey with Christ, if you will. There must be time spent and reading scripture and prayer and meditation and reflection before we can ever attempt to go out and make disciples. Maybe Elizabeth O'Connor said it best in her book when she wrote, renewal, renewal cannot come to the church unless its people are on an inward journey. And, and then she continued, it holds with equal emphasis that renewal cannot come to the church unless its people are on an outward journey. So there has to be an inward journey as well as an outward journey. Being true disciples does not mean that we have to do any of this in a perfect way. However, we are to be faithful. Jesus said go, and Jesus said make disciples. But let's face it, for some of us, the idea of making disciples or sharing our faith with someone that that, that we might not know so well, can be rather scary. Evangelism can be a scary thing for some people, but remember, evangelism can and usually does happen by the way we live our lives, by the way we live our lives day in and day out. So often we model what Jesus means to us by the way we live our lives each and every day speaking his name and sharing our faith at the right time, at the right opportunity, and, and, and going therefore and making disciples of all people to those who are not a part of the church, those who don't know Christ. All of that is part of the Great Commission. But remember, living our lives for Christ each and every day is a very strong part of that Great Commission as well. Going out and, and making disciples can be a hard thing to do, but so can being a disciple in this world in which we live today. Being a disciple in our secular world is not an easy thing, my friends. And yet the truth is, Christianity should not be always expected to be easy. It shouldn't be expected to always be easy. Everything else in life seems to be rather difficult to me. Have you noticed that? that? That everything else in life is difficult. We have people all the time throughout our lives preparing us to get ready for a hard life, a difficult situation. We've heard words like, work hard and you'll get ahead. You can't expect to achieve anything difficult unless you really work at it. The early bird always gets the worm. It's not... Worth, if it's not worth working for, then 
it's not worth having. You, you've heard this. I've heard this all of my life. Then, my friends, why is it that we expect discipleship and the making of disciples in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord to be an easy thing? Why do we expect that? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian and pastor who died for his faith at the hands of the Nazi Germany, in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, speaks out against an easy Christianity. And he also spoke against what he called cheap grace that the church sometimes so easily dispenses, so easily hands out. He, he's by, and we do that, and we know that we do that. We do it by saying things like, Oh, come on, be a part of our church. It's easy and nothing will be required of you. Just come on, be a part of us. That's not what Jesus said. That's not what Jesus said, is it? Jesus said to his followers, Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kind of evil against you falsely on my account. And that's what Jesus said. It's there in the Bible. That, that's what he said. He also said, but before all this occurs, you will be, they will arrest you and persecute you and they will hand you over to the synagogues and prisons and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. Now let me ask you, does that sound easy to you? These are the words that Jesus gave to his disciples. Does not sound easy to me. Listen, my friends, cheap grace only makes cheap disciples. Cheap grace only makes cheap disciples. Churches must challenge us because discipleship in today's world is a challenge in itself. When Abraham Lincoln was president, because of the nature of his office, he couldn't always attend church. However, he, he did form the habit of, of uh, attending the evening service of a church that was within walking distance of the White House. The pastor would be notified that the pres president would be coming a certain night, and, and the pastor would unlock a side door so that the president could ease inside and, and sit where no one could see him. And one night after the service, Mr. Lincoln and his bodyguard were walking back to the White House, and the bodyguard said, that preacher sure did preach a good sermon tonight, didn't he? And Lincoln surprised his companion when he said, no, he really didn't. He spoke pleasant words, but he never challenged me to do one thing without a challenge. It's not a good sermon. Ministers and churches as well, we have a bad habit of dispensing cheap grace. Grace that doesn't challenge us very much. Grace that doesn't require very much of us. And that's not what discipleship is all about. No, this discipleship business, it's not easy. It's not always easy. And don't let anyone try to convince you that it is. But here's the good news. Here is the good news. Jesus said, I will be with you always. I will be with you always. Now, to me, that's good news. That is very good news. Jesus said to his followers, if you will go, and, and uh, if you will make disciples, I will be with you always, always. Have you ever thought about how long always is? Have you ever thought about that, how long always is? This afternoon, Marilyn and I will leave for the Holy Land. And there's just no way that I can describe to you how excited we are about getting to do that. This year is our, I think it's our 37th wedding anniversary. And, and so in a sense, this could be our anniversary trip. When, when we were married, we asked a friend of ours to sing a song that at that time Johnny Mathis had made very popular. The, the song is entitled The Twelfth of Never. Marilyn doesn't, she doesn't even believe I remember that, but I do. And just listen to some of the words. You ask me how much I need you, must I explain? I need you, oh my darling, like roses need to rain. 
I love you, I love you till the bluebells forget to bloom. I love you till the clover has lost its perfume. I love you till the poets run out of rhyme until the twelfth of never. And that's a long, long time. How long is the twelfth of never? Well, it's a long, long time. It's forever. It's forever. And my friend, so is always. So is always. Jesus promises us that, that if we will move inward and be his disciple, and then go outward and make disciples in his name, then he will be with us always, forever. Wendy Bangwell's question was a good question. Reckon where we need more doors in this church so we can welcome people in and so we can worship together and so we can witness our faith in Christ and so we can all grow as disciples. Are you ready? Are you ready? If you are not a disciple of Jesus Christ, then you need to be one. All you have to do is accept, accept Christ as your Lord and Savior this day. If you'd like to be a part of, of our disciple making here in this particular church, we invite you to be a part of us. And can you imagine that? Our hymn of invitation for this day is number 571. Go make of all disciples. Go make of all disciples. Would you not do as, as God leads you to do as we stand and sing this hymn together? Now, my friends, go. Go and be a disciple. Go and make disciples. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord.